Um, first of all, congratulations on the new record, Say to Your Soul. I have an amazing piece of work, I must oh. say. I, don't mean, I listened to it last night for the first time, and I was blown away, I must oh, say. Oh, thank you. Um, this tour that you're on right now is your first solo acoustic tour, is that right? It's the first tour that I've played solo and gone from city to city, but I've played solo for years, kind of here and there, you right. know. Why now? Uh, why are you doing this particular tour now? Uh, I've kind of, the last two years when I was doing my own thing, I spent time playing with my band, and I've played acoustic for years, so I thought it was kind of fair and balanced to come out and do this again. Because I, when I first moved to New Mexico, I played around the States a little bit, but here and there, you know, Texas, Ohio, yeah. whatever, so I thought it would be good to uh, go out on tour and actually make some money as opposed to blow <laughs> it. <laughs> That's a good thing. Um, do you remember what it was that made you want to become a musician years ago? Was, oh. one, was there one incident in your life? It's hard to remember one, but my family was kind of already musical. You know, my parents were in gospel music, you know, with the church, and they did gospel music. My mom played piano. Uh, so I kind of grew up in a family. I remember my sister, we lived in Alaska in the 60s, my sister cranking the Beatles really loud on the stereo, and I thought, wow, it sounded like there's a band in our house, and I was so excited. I grabbed like a Tonka fire engine ladder and started playing air guitar, and you know, from then on I was into it, and eventually actually picked up a real guitar. Right, but you didn't start with guitar, right? Didn't you start with, with piano? Yeah my, piano parents, yeah, my parents had me take piano lessons, which was, I, in retrospect, I realized I learned good structure at the time, but I kind of blew it off just because I really wanted to play guitar. So I had an uncle that came to our house a lot and he played guitar, so he kind of showed me some chords and he kind of was inspirational and uh, he had this spark in his eye and he was like, you want to play guitar? <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah. You know. How did your parents feel about that? Because they were kind of wanted you to be the pian a piano player, right? Well, more than that, they wanted me to kind of, you know, be more like into the church and mm -hmm. play gospel music, which I did. I played bass in church for years. Right. But, you know, they they encouraged me to play music. They didn't necessarily encourage me to play rock music, which I kind of had to, like, <laughs> fight to do. And then eventually they gave up on, you know, hold me back from that and just said, go on. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take before they realized that there was no holding you back with this? Up until I was 18, pretty much, it was kind of like a kind of a battle, but that's not the best word to use, but, you know. How do they feel nowadays? Oh, great. I mean, once you become successful in any way, it, it changes the whole thing, because then it's like, oh, okay, that's all right then. Right, right, of course. Yeah, they see the checks rolling in, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, at the age of 18, uh, you left home, I believe, and you, what I've read is that you've, you left to go work with a group of quote-unquote experimental musicians. Right. What, what was going on there? Where, where did you go? Well, the first thing I did when I left home was to go play with this band that had gigs, and that wasn't really an experimental band, that was kind of like an FM rock band. But not long after that, I hooked up with these guys that were experimental, kind of in the same period. And just, you know, we would just experiment with various uh, <laughs> textures of reality, as it were, <laughs> and, you know, and learned how to kind of play jazz a little bit, and just basically learn about music as a whole thing. You know, mm -hmm. we would play percussion, we would sit out and look at the full moon, Am I inspired, you know, and just kind of everything full on music, you know, and it kind of, it opened my eyes to, you know, more expression as opposed to just doing something off of a record, right. you know, which I was already into expression, but this kind of let it open up a little more, you Does know. Does that kind of stuff still creep in these days? When oh, you're... yeah, I mean, I like all kind of music, you know, heavy metal and acoustic, you know, just, and whatever, you know, whatever has a soul that gives me a, an experience, you know, whatever. Right. And at one point, you actually played in a country band as well, is that not right? Very short time. <laughs> one month. <laughs> Why so <laughs> short? Well, it really wasn't what I wanted to do, basically. And uh, this was back when I was a lot younger. I don't really drink anymore. But it was one of those things where I had to drink to do this gig. And I realized, <laughs> I don't want to go down this road. <laughs> That's a tough gig if you got to get up and have a I was never a, a country. country. I, I respect it, and I appreciate it. But it wasn't something I wanted to do. Right. It's a good discipline, though. <laughs> <laughs> At what age did you finally uh, settle in Charlottesville? Because that's where you, you used to live in Charlottesville, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, I guess I was around 23. I was in the Air Force for eight weeks. And then <laughs> as what I, happened there? How did you get out of that? <laughs> well, it was in 1980 or 81 when, the Air, when the, all the armed services were filling their quotas voluntarily, I guess. So 
it was like if you wanted out, you could get out pretty easy. I'm sure it's different now, but sure. this was a lot looser times, as it were. So I was able to get out. And it was like one of those things. I did it out of desperation. The day I walked in, I was like, this is not what I need to be doing. <laughs> and I was 23, and most people at that time were like 18. So it was, right. you know, most of the time the sergeants are yelling at people because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And I'm like, do what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> And I realized I wanted to play music, so I got out of that and moved to Charlottesville. At the time, I was living in St. Louis, and I kind of, in my mind, thought St. Louis is what drove me to join the Air Force, so I should not go back there. <laughs> yeah. What kind of, you mentioned you were like in this place of like desperation. I mean, what was it? Were you willing to leave your, the, your musical career behind to go into the military? Only because the musical career for me then just was really not happening. I was playing in this, this band and that band, and... Uh, the guys who I was experimenting, the, that, those guys had moved to Florida to go play in a top 40 band. Mm. I didn't want to do that, so I was in the jazz band, but we'd have one gig a month, and then that would be canceled. So right. I wasn't making any money, and right. I was married at the time, and I was like very desperate. And all my family, virtually everyone, was in the military at one point, so that was kind of a thing to fall back on, as it were. And as soon as I got in there, but I realized that wasn't what I, I should be doing you know, <laughs> for my own... So, yeah. you, so you headed off to Charlottesville, mm -hmm. um, Virginia. Did that living in that city shape your the way that you were composing music at that point? It did. When I first moved there, it wasn't. There was no. It had nothing to do with music. It was just to go somewhere else. It mm -hmm. seemed exotic compared to the Midwest. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, I worked at Kmart in the toy department for three years and, and started raising children. And uh, but I started hooking up with these musicians that were really more. They were from New York, and they knew all these people that I thought were really cool, like right. you know, jazz guitarist John Abercrombie, and I was like, wow, these people are connected. <laughs> and it wasn't like connected to something to make it, but connected to musical things, you know? So I would come home from working at night shift for 13 hours at Kmart and stay up the next day and learn, you know, chord, melody, jazz things, you know? And just kind of practice, even though I was 23, I was like, you know, practicing. I always right. got to keep learning stuff. Yeah, you know? still soaking in everything that was around you. Um, what, what point did TR3 come around your band? Well, when I started hooking up with these a group of musicians in Charlottesville, the name of this uh, band at the time was called Cosmology, which was what would be described now as kind of like a world beat jazz group. But at the time, the coin, the term world beat wasn't really around yet. It was just kind of, right. we were like this far out psychedelic <laughs> jazz band. And I kind of got tired of doing that band because it was so much improv that a lot of it sounded the same to me, but that was just my own, you know, my own take on it and I started writing songs and I realized you know I should have had my own band and that was kind of the fantasy I had all my life you know and kind of what drove me to do it was kind of learning all this Bob Marley music just for the sake of it and realize you know this music is so great I want to do this music and play some of my own tunes and that made me feel like I don't care if it sucks if I suck singing or whatever <laughs> Bob Marley is the shit you know he's the shit and right. I gotta do this music because he's like a prophet somebody else needs to play this too because he's dead you know so that kind of started me playing my own band you know and, but, and at once at one point the TR3 became something out a different name right puke matrix puke matrix kind of because i get tired of it being called tr3 although <laughs> to this day still people will call it tr3 but so it's I'm no kinda, longer tr3 not really but if i used if i i mean like i say so many people have heard of it as tr3 that name will probably stick with it although we call it puke matrix kind of <laughs> in a humorous way <laughs> right where did Even, that name come from just being on the road we would come up with a different name every week <laughs> like one week we were driving down a highway and there was a sign that said uh, custard's Fort Custard, and I said, why don't you just name it Fort Kick My Ass? <laughs> so that was the name of the band one week. One week it was called The Fresh Balls of Hercules. <laughs> and I just got into the whole science of right. band names, which I would go to each town and look at the flyers, and there'd be all these great punk band names, and I was like, I want to have a funny name, too. <laughs> so Puke Matrix, and then as soon as I came up with that name, I was in L.A. on one of the Dave Matthews tours, and right. there was a big sign on the wall. The Matrix, and I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they stole my name. But I, is there another name lined up to, for the for the band? I don't Anything know. We'll else? probably next time we come out, come up with yet another one. But I'm sure people will call it Tier Three. For a sure. while, they call it the Tim Reynolds Electric Trio, but that was even like more generic than yeah. anything. <laughs> we would come up with different names. Power Trouble was one name. <laughs> Electric <laughs> Power Trouble, they call it one game. <laughs> Those are great. Um, now I've read articles where you talk about the acoustic guitar. And you use the word gen that you have a genuine reverence for the instrument. Mm -hmm. What is it about this instrument that ins inspires reverence in you? 
A couple of things. One is it's a little more of a challenge because when I play the acoustic, I kind of use it like in a way that uh, like jazz guitarist Joe Pass used it as an orchestral instrument. You know, you kind of get to play the bass mm -hmm. and the melody or at least try to. And the sound of it is just great because you can take it out of the case, sit down with it, and wow, it sounds great. You don't have to go through, plug it up an amp, plug it into the wall, get mm -hmm. a chord out and all this stuff. And playing electric guitar, I kind of play more like my earlier history of playing in basements and, and parties and just rocking out, which I still love to do. That's why I like all the new heavy metal bands. Mm -hmm. But acoustic guitar, I kind of go into the different periods and it kind of all becomes more, you know, bringing in all the different kind of musics as opposed to like playing with a band where you kind of go for a simpler, uh, uh, you know, right, that kind right. of the, the, this part of the body, you know. And then when I play acoustic, I use this part of the body and more but up here and you kind of get into like a more introverted thing and you spread out and do more, not necessarily, I don't want to say musical, because the other thing is musical too, but you know, just kind of more open up different chakras where you play that kind of music that makes you go, ah, oh, as opposed to, ah, oh, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, even, but on your new album though, you have these like songs that are so serene and beautiful, and then from one song to the next, you'll it kicks into like these very almost aggressive right. things. Right. Oh, yeah. So you can do both, it depend, regardless of what instrument you're doing. You're using. Yeah. I, I guess I just always, thing. yeah, I guess I just always like to have both elements in the music. You mm -hmm. know, I really respect bands that can do more than one thing. You know, the next record will probably be strictly acoustic, and then after that, I'll probably go crazy again. <laughs> <laughs> um, improvisation is a major, major part of your technique, mm -hmm. right? It, it, what, are there moments when you're recording or on stage where you like where you surprise yourself? I sometimes yeah, yeah sometimes you try to do that and different songs have different some songs are strictly it's all structured and then you have like a little bit of improv and then some songs are just barely structured and a lot of improv mm -hmm. and then once in a while you just kind of ah I'm just gonna <laughs> improvise you know and that's how you, that's how I write a lot too I'll sit down with the guitar and. A lot of times I'll come off the road and sit down and just, boom, I'll write something right then, you know. And sometimes you just sit down and you start playing a song, you know. It's, you know, you just kind of, I don't want to do that. I want to wait till something happens, you know. <laughs> and music is always available. You just kind of have to be open to the vibe of it, you know. Right. What happens to you on stage when, you're, when you get into, like, a, an extended jam that's just, like, going off on a tangent? What do you think, what's going on in your head? Is it calculated at all? Or are you Usually completely when spontaneous? Usually, when it really is good, there's absolutely nothing going on in your head. It's like complete open meditation. You know, you're kind of, you spend this time concentrating, and then all of a sudden you, you open up a window, and then you're not even there anymore, and that's when it's really cool. But those, those moments are so small, but in your mind they're expanded to like infinity. You know, you have like, it might happen for two minutes while you're really lost, but it seems like forever, and then you come back and you go like, oh, wow, I'm back in the room, <laughs> you know, and that's really what it's all about, you know, but you can't really plan that. You just kind of have to set up a situation where you're open to that, and, you know, when you play music for a long time, you kind of don't depend on that because right. you kind of have to learn how to play something and think about it or think about it enough so that you set up the experience so that it kind of rolls itself, and then as it's rolling, sometimes something else will come in, and that's the great, that's the cool moment. Does that happen in the studio as well when you're in there recording? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, it's kind of like wherever you are. You know, the studio is a little more clinical because you're setting up to get a good sound, and you've kind of usually you've thought about what you're going to do enough that you don't just go in there and say, "Well, what are we going to do today?" <laughs> Although that's the right. best. That's fun too. I mean, a lot of times, like on my new album, all of those pieces of music that are multi instrumental sounding, mm -hmm. that's completely improv. I mean, yeah, the only no thing, that, yeah, the only thing that wasn't improvised about those pieces was the sounds like, okay, I'm going to use this drum sound, that's what I'm going to do, and then get a couple other sounds, so you already have sounds like wow. from the keyboards, and, and then you just play the groove, and then you start building, and then the guy who mixes it kind of makes it sound more like comp composed, whereas you improvise a lot of pieces, and then as you listen to it over and over, you think, okay, well, this section, let's not have that going on so that it sounds more like a cohesive thing. That's, you know, and that's that's like writing in the studio. You, that's, so you seem like excited talking about that. That must be like oh, the, God, the yeah. best part of it, of it all is those spontaneous moments. Oh, yeah. I mean, it used to be when I was really poor, you couldn't really afford to spend the money and just go and waste <laughs> time like that, as it were. But as you get older, you realize that's the part that's the almost, the, not the best, but one of the best things about it. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I have a lot of tunes when I go in again that are more like tunes that I've written that I'm going to do on acoustic. Because since it's more like a... You know, you're trying to play a bass and the chords and a melody, you kind of have to structure it a little more because there's more that you want to have going on. And then as you get more used to playing it, like you get used to playing the bass and the chords, you kind of become, you can let 
little notes slip in that aren't planned, you know, and you kind of right. build it up in a different way, you know, whereas when you're playing like with a, a drum machine, you want to play it like a real drum, it's it's a little more improv because you're just like playing a groove and you're like, hey, <laughs> grooving, man, you know. Do, do your, does your recorded material capture the the energy of, a, of one of your live shows? That's spontaneity, and it, and that it's feeling? And it, it's best it does. At yeah. its worst, you're kind of like structuring a song that you've written and then try to build. When you do multi-tracking, you can, you know, one track that might be the drums might have more of a, I thought this part up, and then you get to the guitar. Usually the guitar is the most loose bit, and then you kind of create a couple of tracks of that, and you go, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then maybe it's the keyboards or whatever. And I guess, you know, did I answer your question? Yeah, you okay. certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, do you get inspiration from everyday sounds that you hear? Oh, like, yeah. Like what? What's, what's the last thing that's, that's, like, inspired you that you us normal, like, schmoes wouldn't figure out? The last thing that really blew me away... This is really far out. <laughs> I was, I had just come off the road the first night at home, and I didn't go to bed till like four because I'm always excited when I get home. I stay up and listen to CDs <laughs> up in the studio. I'm laying in bed, and uh, we live out in the country, and the wind was blowing through the window, and it sounded like a flute. It was hitting some kind of thing. It was going like, and I was thinking in my head, what are those notes? And I thought, this is like a major third going to a minor third and then back to the root down to the seventh. That's what that is. I've got to remember that. So now once in a while, if I'm into a, a little bit of an improv, I'll play it. But it doesn't sound like that when I play it. I play those notes, but, you know, that's something like that will just inspire me. And it was so cool sound. I was like, I listen to that now every night when the windows open. Wow. It's like the wind blows a certain way because the bedroom is kind of circular and then there's mm -hmm. this big porch area and the wind comes up off these hills we live by these hills you know and it just starts to blow at an angle and it's like mm -hmm. like a bottle or something you know really cool really cool that's amazing that is an amazing thing um i have to ask you obviously um when you when the album live at luther college uh, mm -hmm. came out with dave matthews did did that did all the press and the excitement that generate that that album generated how did that change your career specifically I guess it just kind of upped the ante once again. I mean, I already kind of been doing some acoustic tours with Dave. That was that recording was like the first one we did, but that was in '96. So we did one in '96, '97, another one in '99. So that just kind of in a long arc of time where that you know already was helping whatever my career is just from the first recording with him. Right. That immediately boom, you know, uh, and so that just made it more. I guess right. is. Easiest thing to say. And you guys, I mean, there's clearly something very special when you guys play together. I mean, anyone oh, yeah. who's seen it or heard the album can tell. And what what is it that's so special between you and him when you're on the, on stage playing together? I think it's the rapport of friendship and the sense of humor that Dave has and that I have. Because like, when we first met, it was kind of like we had already knew each other from high school, even though we didn't. But that kind of rapport, you know, he's this very funny guy. He's a very super great person, very friendly person. And we met, you know, he was working as a bartender at this restaurant where I played every Monday, but he was obviously, just from the first words out of his mouth, you knew he knew about music. Right. Very, like, obviously a musician of high caliber, just from the, you know, you can tell somebody when they say two things about, when you're both listening to the same piece of music and he'll notice some little thing. Right. Even people that don't even play instruments have an ear like that. And I was just like, oh, this guy's obviously a musician. And then we started, you know, playing, with four track recordings and we just have a blast. So every time we get together, there's like this, there's a sense of humor and a, and a rapport, you know, and that comes through with when we play acoustic yeah. guitars, you know. Will you guys tour again or make another record, do you think? I hope so, Yeah, definitely. Very good, and what's next for you now after, after uh, now that the album's out? And well, this album actually I recorded last year right after the last tour we did and I just kind of sat on it for a while so I could do a band project and so, as soon as I get home, I'm going back in the studio and, and record all these songs that I wrote earlier this year about an acoustic guitar, which I didn't really, hadn't really written anything on acoustic for a couple of years. So I started writing by improvising, which is the way I work for the band. And so all of a sudden, all this music came out, most of it on a 12 string. So I'm going to go record that and do that and then go back out on tour in the fall, probably still promoting this CD that's out now. And that one will probably come out later in the year.